Welcome to Climate State, a weekly to bi-weekly broadcast on what's going on with the Earth's climate system. This is your host, Gerard Spring, coming to you from the north. So I want to sound a geoengineering warning, and I think we're going to be seeing a lot of geoengineering here in the next couple of years, and I want to go over some of the specific things with regards to geoengineering and how it works, what's going on, and how it's actually done in practice. Earth has now crossed the 410 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere, and the baseline CO2 in the atmosphere is about 280 parts per million if we look at pre-industrial levels. So we're about to the 50% increase in CO2 over what is normal. And with this, of course, we're seeing a lot of warming. We're seeing growing issues with permafrost thaw. We're seeing Arctic methane release as well as a lot of erratic weather patterns, especially in the mid-latitudes and in the Arctic. In order to combat this, a lot of people have been talking about geoengineering, and particularly the idea of solar radiation management. And the idea behind solar radiation management is to inject nanoparticles or particulate matter into the lower stratosphere in order to create a cirrus cloud layer, a high altitude layer of fine ice crystals that will reflect some of the incoming radiation from the sun back into space. Of course, the idea behind this is that when we reflect more energy back into space, less of it reaches the surface and gets trapped in the atmosphere, thereby cooling the planet. So I want to go over a couple of articles in particular that are really attempting to get geoengineering into the mainstream. In particular, I want to take a look at the MIT Technology Review article that was published on April 18th, 2017 by James Temple. The title of the article is The Growing Case for Geoengineering. I'm going to quote from the article a bit here. As climate change accelerates, a handful of scientists are eager to move ahead with experiments testing ways to counteract warming artificially. Their reasoning, we might just get desperate enough to use this technology one day. And in this article, Temple interviews a atmospheric physicist, David Mitchell, who's working at the University of Nevada. Moving down in the article a little bit, it says, it would work like this. Fleets of large drones would crisscross the upper latitudes of the globe during winter months, sprinkling the skies with tons of fine dust-like materials every year. If Mitchell is right, this would produce larger ice crystals than normal, creating thinner cirrus clouds that would dissipate faster. This would allow more radiation into space, cooling the Earth, Mitchell says. Done on a large enough scale, this cloud seeding could ease global temperatures by as much as 1.4 degrees Celsius, more than the planet has warmed since the Industrial Revolution, according to a separate Yale study. It's important to note that Mitchell's scheme is a little bit different than traditional geoengineering schemes insofar as it uses the geoengineering materials to disperse high-altitude clouds during the dark winter months in the Arctic, thereby letting the long-wave radiation out to generate effective cooling during the winter season in the Northern Hemisphere. I also want to take a look at another MIT Technology Review article that was written just a week later on April 25th, 2017 by Janos Pastor. And the title of the article is Rules for Geoengineering the Planet. And the headline is, we have to at least consider geoengineering. And that's where the problems start. So I'm going to quote a bit from the article here as well. The 2015 Paris Climate Agreement was a major milestone, but the truth is, achieving its ambitious goal of keeping temperatures to within 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius of pre-industrial levels would require rates of mitigation far in excess of what's been achieved, or even what's been planned. Because of this, more people are contemplating geoengineering, notably solar radiation management, which involves reflecting a portion of the sun's radiation back into space. The idea raises many questions. We don't know how effective it would be, and we don't fully understand its potential impacts, and there are also ethical issues about its use and governance. We also need to acknowledge the aggregate environmental and socioeconomic risks of solar radiation management that would probably be small in comparison with the benefits of reducing global temperatures, the article says. But those benefits and harms would be unequally spread among regions of the world between current and future generations. In the absence of multilateral agreements, there's no way of controlling who might execute such a geoengineering plan. It's possible that a small group of countries or a single country or a large company or even a wealthy individual might take unilateral action on geoengineering. Others might subsequently engage in their own climate engineering strategies to counter such an action. To avoid such a future, we should establish global governance frameworks, 
Currently, there is really only one forum that could give legitimacy to any such framework for geoengineering, the United Nations General Assembly. So what this article is essentially talking about is the need to create international governmental agreements regarding geoengineering strategies, geoengineering programs, and different methods of geoengineering, how they should be executed, and by whom they should be executed, and who gets the rights to geoengineer, and who does not get the rights to geoengineer. So I want to take some time to discuss how geoengineering could be implemented in practice. In particular, how do we actually deliver nanoparticulates to the upper atmosphere, and what are the nanoparticulates that we're talking about? So in nature, there are all kinds of sources of condensation nuclei that can be kicked up into the upper atmosphere, for example. You can have dust that's lifted up from storms into the high troposphere, into the lower stratosphere. You can even have bacteria and viruses acting as condensation nuclei. And these are always circulating upwards and downwards throughout the air column, and we see them ultimately as cirrus clouds. So in order to do this artificially, one needs to find a material which will mimic the process that is occurring in nature. A common favorite of the geoengineers is to use aluminum oxide nanoparticles for the reason that aluminum oxide is relatively inert. Additionally, it's fairly straightforward to produce these nanoparticles in solution, for example, using chemical methods, and they aren't terribly expensive to produce. And one can also have good control over the size of the nanoparticles. Condensation nuclei in nature are typically of order 200 nanometers or 0.2 micrometers in size. And to give you an idea of how small this actually is, the typical red blood cell in, in, in the body is about six to eight micrometers in size or 6,000 to 8,000 nanometers in size. So the nanoparticles we're considering here are actually quite a bit smaller than the cells that are the red blood cells that are flowing through our bodies. So it's pretty straightforward to produce these nanoparticles using modern chemical techniques, and they can be added to fuel, they can be added to kerosene, they can be added to ethanol, for example, or they can be dispersed in water. And there's quite a bit of research that's actually going on regarding nanoparticulates in fuel additives. To give you guys an example of this, I want to point out an article that was published in the International Journal of Material and Mechanical Engineering, the IJNME, Volume 4, 2015. And this is droplet evaporation behavior of kerosene nano-aluminium fuels at high pressure environment, written by uh, some scientists at the Department of Aerospace Engineering and the School of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering in the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology, Republic of Korea. In the abstract, it says, this experimental study investigated the effects of nanoparticles on evaporation rate of kerosene-based nanofluid fuels in high pressure environments. The base liquid fuel was kerosene and aluminum nanoparticles with an average 70 nanometer diameter were used. Oleic acid was used as surfactant to synthesize the stable nanofluid fuels, and the effect of oleic acid was investigated for comparison. The concentration of aluminum nanoparticles were 0.1 and 1.0% by mass fraction, and the ambient pressure was increased from 0.1 megapascals to 2.5 megapascals. So I also want to take some time to hack through the introduction here a little bit. Recently, several studies have been conducted about solid fuels and liquid fuels containing nanoparticles, and they have been shown to have multiple advantages of adding nanoparticles, such as shortened ignition delay, increased energy density, and high burn rates. The addition of nanoparticles to fluids can also enhance its physical properties, such as thermal conductivity, mass diffusivity, and radiative heat transfer. As a result, it is possible in principle to achieve the desired properties and performance of liquid fuel by adding some energetic material nanoparticles. Nanofluids are stable suspensions of solid nanoparticles, 10 to 100 nanometers in size, in conventional heat transfer fluids. They are used to show different thermophysical properties from their base fluids, such as thermal conductivity, mass diffusivity, surface tension, radiative property, and non-Newtonian viscosity. Tayang and all conducted hot plate experiments and observed that addition of small amounts of aluminum and aluminum oxide nanoparticles, the ignition probability for nanoparticle-laden diesel fuel was significantly higher than pure diesel. And it goes on and on and discusses some of the properties of combusting fuels. So this is exactly the kind of study that would be useful for describing how nanoparticle-laden fuel would pass through a high-temperature, high-pressure environment such as a combustion engine or an aircraft engine. 
So these types of fuel additives using synthesized nanoparticles is great for small scale and medium scale geoengineering projects and could be used to do types of tests, various tests on effectiveness of nanoparticle size, nanoparticle composition, etc. However, for a large scale geoengineering project, the amount of material required is absolutely massive and the synthesis technique would be relatively expensive and a cheaper alternative would be needed. So the geoengineers need another solution in order to do these large-scale geoengineering projects that would actually be effective in managing the climate system as they would like to do. A typical solution that's cited as being cheap and widely plentiful is the use of coal fly ash. And coal fly ash is the combustion product of burning coal in coal-fired power plants. If we look at the particle size of fine coal fly ash, it fits the bill coming in around 500 nanometers to a couple hundred microns. And if we look at the main composition of coal fly ash, we have silicon dioxide, aluminum oxide, and calcium oxide, which are relatively inert and could be used as fuel additives. So with coal fly ash, we have a nanoparticle solution that could be used, especially if one could manage to filter out the larger particle sizes. However, with coal fly ash, you also get other elements from the coal bed which are quite toxic, such as arsenic, beryllium, chromium, cobalt, mercury, thallium, lead, and others which could be quite toxic as they rain down from the uh, geoengineering sprays. So in order to get these materials into the upper atmosphere, the idea is to use the commercial air fleet as a vector for delivery. The nanoparticulate additives can be added to the fuels of commercial aircraft and when they pass through the combustion chamber of the aircraft they will be dispersed into the upper atmosphere and act as condensation nuclei. It's a very straightforward solution which does not require the retrofitting of really any economic activity on the planet so everything can continue on as normal by using these additives. There are commercial aircraft flying all the time on well-planned and well-understood routes, and geoengineering is, in effect, something that's very possible and very feasible, especially using cheap alternatives such as the coal fly ash solution. I think it's very, very important to be aware of this and to understand that geoengineering is a reality. Geoengineering is going on right now. There are geoengineering projects. There is research going on in geoengineering. There is massive amounts of funding going on for geoengineering. And geoengineering is coming into the mainstream. Geoengineering is an all-out assault on Earth's climate systems. And the effect of these materials coming down from the upper atmosphere can be incredibly damaging for marine biosystems, forest biosystems, rivers, lakes, and others as well. So please do not hesitate to share this presentation with others, especially those who are skeptical of geoengineering. So if you found this presentation useful, please hit that like button and subscribe. Additionally, if you have any questions about geoengineering, please post them down in the comments section below and I'll try to get to them as quick as I can. Also, if you're interested in supporting the Burning Earth Project, you can check out my website at www.burningearthradio.com or you can also check out my Patreon account, which you can find on my channel homepage. I'm looking forward to having you along for the next one and thank you so much for listening.